I'm here to introduce, uh, and not even introduce, but just to present Dr. Jamil Wiley Sr. Right now. Uh, he's going he's gonna to speak tonight, I was saying the other day, the other week, if I hadn't heard him nor Patrick preaching a long time, so I said I needed to schedule him to get up uh, to preach, and I, I didn't know if I was going to make it back in time tonight, so y'all know what he found out tonight. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but he and Brother Williams, uh, they're used to it by now, so they have no issues uh, with my last minuteness. Uh, the Bible says be ready. Amen. So, all right, be ready. So he's going to come tonight, and he's going to give us a powerful word, because he studies all the time. And so I always tell him that we preach from the overflow of what we study. So he doesn't even need time. I didn't even have to give him two hours notice. I could have gave him 30 seconds notice, and he would have been ready to come up and talk about what he's been studying. So tonight, he's going to come. And I'm so very proud of, of Jameer. Jameer's my buddy, because close, we're close in age. But his commitment to the Lord and to study uh, is with kindred spirits when it comes to that. And it's difficult to find young folk who are that in tune to the Word of God. And of course I learn from Jimmy all the time because he uh, he has, I mean he has endeavored to even get married and have a family. And so sometimes I look at him and I just go, I'm going to be like him when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can't wait to hear from him tonight and then of course uh, next week you'll probably hear from Will Williams. Uh, That's too much notice. Too much notice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I just can't wait for it. So as it has become a custom that before Jimmy preaches, his daddy leads a song. And so we're going to call his daddy up to lead us in a song before his son comes to preach. Amen. Amen. So he's going to come on up and, uh, and, and bless us. I, I can't wait for him because Jimmy is such a great expositor. I can't, I can't wait to hear Oh, you need the book. Oh, you switch your song? Get in the book. <laughs> I was waiting on, whoa. You can't even the book. <laughs> stand to your feet, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. Amen. <laughs> you can't even get the book, you're shocked. You know why? Don't you know be why? talking about it. Because he talked about me bad. So. <laughs> yeah, in sickness or something. <laughs> I want to ask Jerry Bishop Father Church Christ, but he have to run the camera, sing, bass, and preach. It's all your gifts. Jesus is a rock. You know what? I sang that last week and the preacher talked about it real bad. So, I'll sing my other favorite song. All right. Uh, 473, farther along. This is my yeah. favorite song. Oh, God. Tempted and tried, we Chapter 3 and 
uh, in the effort to keep it short, I'll just try to do verse number seven. Preach the word, God. But um, he was not lying when he said that. He does not believe in giving notice. <laughs> this is my fourth time preaching, and the only time I ever had notice was the first time. So I stayed up way too late last night and was like, oh, I'll just get a nap after church. Nope. I found out like three hours ago I had to preach. So I'm like, okay. Um, let me get my orange juice. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. You may be seated. If you need a title for uh, this text this evening, um, I'll just call it Handle with Care. Um, Brother Miam said something earlier that he, he's been saying for quite a long time, and I never understood fully until I started to preach when he said that we don't, we don't study for sermons, or we don't study to preach, but we study to feed ourselves. Right. And that once you become proficient in feeding yourselves, you can do that enough to where when you're called upon to feed others, you can just take a little bit uh, from the overflow. Yeah. And even though I always heard that, I never fully understood it until, um, and I still don't all the time because it, it gets hard when you have a job and a wife and a kid and, and, and just life in general to try to, to try to keep yourself studied all the time and to try to feel like, I could get called at any moment for a Bible study, to teach a class, to preach, to do whatever it is. But but when you really are just studying for yourself, you find that when it comes time for you to share things with other people, and it, it and the word really just connects with your life, it, it just comes it just comes so easy. So with us studying First Peter uh, on Tuesday nights, and just to go along with my own personal studies today, I did the same thing. I sat down and said, "What?" I don't talk about. I said, okay, this is just something that's been, that's been. I know me and Avery, we've been talking about it. It's just been kind of in my mind, and uh, so, so I'm just going to share a little bit of that tonight. I'm going to try to be short, but I also promise that even though it took me at least a month to get this verse down, I got pages and pages of notes. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to condense it and, and, and give it to you all tonight. So first, I want to uh, give you the the, the uh, scriptural context of the verse and then, and then I'll just uh, make a few points and I'll, I'll break down the text and later on I'll give you the historical context and then I'll take my seat. So when we look at the book of 1 Peter, uh, we are looking at Christians who are dealing uh, with persecution. Uh, whether it be uh, from, the inside or from the inside or from the outside, we have some Christians uh, uh, who are, times are getting rough, so to speak. So with that in mind, Peter writes this book to them, uh, uh, saying, now that you're in the church, but you found out that things don't, always won't go so smooth, uh, let me help you uh, to live your life on this earth as a Christian. So in, in the book of 1 Peter, the entire um, first chapter is dedicated to a deeper look at salvation. So you may ask yourself, why is Peter taking the time to explain uh, salvation to a people who have already been saved? Uh, but the answer is actually very simple, is that if you truly understand how much work, how much effort, how much time, and how much foreknowledge God put into saving you and I uh, through a plan that was hatched before the worlds were even formed, that when times get a little bit rough and tough, you don't start to question God. You don't say, why am I going through these things? Am I truly saved? I thought I passed this test already. Those kinds of things. So he spends the entire first chapter giving them a deeper look into salvation. And it's when we get to chapter 2 that he says, now that you understand how exactly you got saved, I will, I will give you some practical application to help you understand how to live now that you have been saved. So chapter, starting in chapter 2, throughout the rest of the book, he, he just gives them uh, ways to live their everyday lives. And in chapter 2, around verse number 13, he deals with the subject of um, submission. I, I saw a couple. <laughs> I saw a couple frowns. And ladies, be honest. I know that submission is probably your least favorite word uh, in the New Testament. Just it, it, you be honest. I see it. I see it. But and, and this isn't this isn't my subject, but it, it, it ties in. But but I truly believe that once you have a 
a, a, a deep and a true understanding of submission, it will really bless your lives, not only for men and women, not only for husbands and wives, but for us living on earth as, uh, as strangers, as, as uh, citizens, or rather residents on earth, even though our citizenship is in heaven, um, I, I, I want you to know that submission isn't, isn't like a punishment or isn't yes. uh, um, something that is only called, called for women to do, but it's something that is expected of every Christian, uh, man and female, uh, in, in some form or another. It is something that uh, we are all called to do. Submission is a Christian characteristic that is birthed out of being controlled by or filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and you may be called to submit to uh, the government, you may be called to submit to your boss, to the leadership of the church, and whatever it is, and that if you're struggling uh, uh, with submission, maybe don't try to pick out the flaws of the one that you have to submit to, but maybe look in the mirror and see, am I truly filled uh, with the Holy Spirit? So it's with that thought that, that Peter tells all Christians, male and female, to submit to the governing authorities. And then when you get to verse number 18, he tells all Christians, if you happen to be slaves, uh, it's okay, submit to your masters. Work for them uh, like you're working for God. Yes, yes, so when he yes. says, while I'm on the subject of Christian submission, when we get to verse uh, chapter number 3, he says, wives also submit to your husbands. That's chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And he says, and while I'm on the subject of husband and wives, husbands likewise dwell with your wives with an understanding. Um, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So that's how we get to this particular text. And I know it seems like if you just separate chapter 3 that the women get six verses and the men get just one. I know it seems that way, but I promise you there's so much information in verse number 7. I promise you it's eaten. It's okay. So I, I promise. I know it seems lopsided, but I promise. So... So, so to give you the breakdown of the verse, uh, Peter says, first I'm going to tell you what I need you to do. Then I'm going to tell you how to do it. Then I'm going to give you three reasons why you should do it. Come on, Doc. So he says, first I want you to dwell with your wives with an understanding. Okay. How do you do that? I want you to give honor to the wives. And why should you do that? It's because that A, they are the weaker vessel. Two, that you are heirs together in the grace of life. And three, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Yes, sir. So first he says, I want you to dwell with him with an understanding. And, and, and I want you to know that dwelling is, is different from, from just living or just being around. Yeah. Dwelling is to, 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 to really strive to make your home with someone. In the marriage bond, it's, it's being in wedlock. It's being in union. And, and, and we all, including myself, have been guilty of guilty of living with, but not truly dwelling with our wives. We may come home, kiss your wife on the forehead, plop down in front of your TV for the rest of the night, and that's it. If it's in my case, I may be sitting next to her, I may be listening to her, but I got my phone now, I got my iPad out. You know, she asks me how I'm doing, and I say, no, I'm fine. How was your day? On and on, and here, just kind of, even though I may be listening, I may be saying, yeah, okay, what? Well, no, that's great, really, okay, yeah. I'm so interested, but if I'm not really giving her my full attention, I'm not truly uh, making an effort to dwell with her. I'm not making an effort to make um, every chance I get uh, uh, just, to, just to make our relationships be unified. So he said, not only do you need to dwell with him, but you need to do so with knowledge or with an understanding. This type of knowledge is the knowledge that you get um, from experience. In other words, if you're not dwelling with her, you can't truly know um, how to deal with her. It, it's it's a knowledge oh, that God. you can only get from from from, from being attentive Teach to her needs. It's a knowledge you can only get from from truly watching and, and, and studying your wives. It's it's the type of knowledge that after you see something take place, you take it back, you process it, and then you put your theory together with an application. And then, and then you live it out. So, but I, I want the men to know that um, Peter isn't asking us to do anything that is unusual. He's not asking us to do anything that we're not used to doing. Um, this is how we solve problems on an everyday basis. Us men being logical, women typically being more emotional, 
We're just we're just straight to the point. You give us a problem, we get an answer. You you give us a I don't know, a bike to put together, a lawnmower, a barbecue grill, a piece of technology. We don't need the instructions. We just look at it, analyze it, try to fix it, try to put it together. Uh, you can ask any man about their favorite sport, their favorite team, their favorite set of golf clubs, their favorite hunting spot. They can tell you stats and stories and stuff from 20 years ago. And just One of my least favorite things to do is to watch football with other men. Now, I love football, but if I'm watching the game, I want to actually watch the game. I don't want to listen to you regurgitate all the stats that you soaked up from the pregame <laughs> the pre show. I'm not interested in that. And us men, that, it just goes to show that's, that's how we are. That's naturally how we are. But if that is the case, why is it that when it comes to our wives, we can be so absent-minded? How is it that... You can be married for 15, 20, 30 years and don't know simple things like what's her favorite TV show? What's her favorite food? What size shoe does she wear? You know, you may have known at one point, but people change and we grow and all that and, and in life, you know, we change. And so if we're not truly making an effort to dwell with them with an understanding, then we can't, we can't treat them the way that we're supposed to. Right. So he tells you, I need you to dwell with him with an understanding. And then he says, now how do you do this at giving honor to the wife? Uh, does anyone translation say rendering instead of giving? Rendering is truly a, a, a better translation because the original language here means to dispense the proper amount. It means to, to portion off or to section off the right amount of honor. And honor here is truly in the original language, it's truly, uh, it's, it's to place value on. It's to assess something and give it the proper price. It's like if you've ever seen uh, Antiques Roadshow. It's a person may find something, they think it may be valuable, but they don't know enough about it. So when you go to Antiques Roadshow, there will be someone there who knows enough about that article. Oh where they can God. just look at it and they can tell you the history of it. They can tell you the story behind it. They can tell you whether it's real or fake, and they can just look at it and say, oh yeah, if you take this to auction, you may get $15,000. Peter is saying that, man, when it comes to your women, you need to treat them like an antique, and you need to be the appraiser. I need you to study them on a daily basis so you know what your wife needs, you know about exactly what she's worth, you know exactly how much honor that she needs, how much value she has. It's like if you go to the store and you find something on the shelf without a price tag, you're going to have to go find one of the machines where you can scan it so the machine will show you how much it's worth. Our job as the men are to be the ones who can tell you exactly how much the wife is worth. Hey, you know, now, <laughs> right, right, right. Now, now uh, allow me to give this, this uh, illustration because this, this really helped me. So if the woman is a vessel and the job of the man is to fill the vessel with the proper amount. Then she is the receiver and we're the giver. If she's the vessel, we are the faucet that pours into the vessel. So our job is to pay enough attention to know exactly uh, uh, how full that vessel needs to be. And, and, I, and there's something I found out that will help both men and women is that when your faucet is running and when her vessel is full, both of you will be more secure. Uh, I remember one time a friend asked me, you know, why is it that, that some men are just so uh, controlling and so jealous and they don't want you to go anywhere and they don't want you to talk to anybody if you're not there and they, they don't want you showing any skin from the neck down and, you know, just, just have that thing. And I, and I told them it's because it's just insecurity. It's if you're handling your business, you don't have anything uh, to be worried about. <laughs> if you're handling your business, you don't have anything to be worried about. If, if she is full, and if you dispense the proper amount of honor to the wife, you're not concerned about what else someone else is trying to put in. I'm not concerned if she's just going to the store and meets an old high school buddy. I'm not concerned who's sending 
friend request on Facebook because I know that my faucet is running so there, there's nothing else someone else can add <laughs> if they try to come into the picture and just put drops in. Hey! And, on the, <laughs> and on the flip side, man, if you're truly making an effort and it's an everyday thing, just sowing honor into your wife, she can be more secure about you because she says that he's putting so much effort and energy and to me, I know he doesn't have time to be trying to share that with us. So he, you know, he, it's a two-way street. It helps, it helps both men. It helps both men and women. So, so, so far we have husbands. What do you do? Dwell with your wives with an understanding. How do you do it? Giving honor to the wife. Now, here's the three reasons why. As to the weaker vessel being heirs together in the grace of life and so that your prayers may not be hindered. And I'll be honest, when I first sat down to study this text, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I literally sat down and I wrote the question at the top of the page. What does it mean that she's weaker than I am? And I was trying to make it fit into a specific category and I would say, is it because she's physically weaker? And here I am looking at interlinear Bibles and the word weak here literally means without strength. I would say, well, maybe, but there are some women who are physically stronger than men. So how can that be the case? If you follow UFC, there's a woman named Ronda Rousey who could whoop every man in here. <laughs> so I said, that can't be the case. That's not always true. Um, so then I said, well, may maybe it's emotionally. You know, maybe, you know, women tend to be more emotionally um, expressive than men, but then I said, well, there's a lot of weak men and there are a lot of families that have only survived because there are women who have been emotionally strong enough to hold the family together when there was a man who was absent or a man who was not strong enough uh, to handle his responsibilities. So I said, you know, that, that can't be it either. But then I had to take a step backwards and I said, okay, maybe I shouldn't be looking for exactly how is the woman weaker than the man, because every person is different. And I notice, okay, even though the word literally means uh, without strength, that that adjective is modifying the noun there of vessel. And this isn't the, this isn't the only place in the New Testament that humans were compared uh, to vessels. And then I then I realized that Peter does not say she is a weak vessel but a weaker vessel, meaning that men, we are vessels too, and we are also weak. And it's only that the woman is weaker when you juxtapose her next to the male. So when you put the two together, you realize that they are both weaker. It's not, the purpose of it isn't to, to necessarily figure out how every woman is weaker, but how do you care for it? And, and don't get me wrong, this doesn't, when I say weaker, it doesn't mean that you're not equal, that you're inferior. It just means if I have two two vessels, one made out of glass and one made out of plastic, I need to care for the one made out of glass more because if I drop it, it'll break. You can drop plastic, you can sit on plastic. You know, it, it's just plastic, it'll bounce back. And it, and it and that's what I realized, it, it doesn't matter. You know, each man, once he dwells with his own wife, according to knowledge, he'll know exactly how it is that she needs to be handled. So, but the purpose is that if we're both vessels, we are equal, but we're just different kinds. We have our own strengths. If you go camping and you need water, you're going to carry a thermos because it's rugged. It's made out of hard plastic, metal. You can throw it in a bag, throw it on the ground. It doesn't matter. But if you have a dinner party, you're not going to put out glass plates, forks, knives, silverware, and thermoses on the table. And that doesn't make sense. But even though the thermos is better suited for camping, it's not better suited for a dinner party. So the woman, in this case, would be maybe fine china, maybe a wine glass, something you have to care for more than a thermos. And uh, you may you may ask why is this important, but keep in mind that in this day, that uh, women were not viewed as equals to men. This teaching was actually radical. It, um, you know, in this day, marriage was not a union that was birthed out of love. It was more of a transfer of the property from the father to the husband. It was most of the time it rains. It was even paid for in the form of a dowry and it was the, the daughter went from belonging to the husband to belonging uh, to the husband. And if you don't value your wife properly, 
you are not going to treat it with the right amount of honor. So, so Peter is saying that yes, you are different. Yes, you both have different strengths and different weaknesses. But I need you to treat her as your equal, and I need you to um, not treat her the way you would treat one of your boys. It's like when I was growing up, my dad used to always tell me. Whatever you want to do, whatever sport, whatever club you want to play, I will fully support you, but you cannot quit if you want to play hockey, soccer, football, join Boy Scouts, whatever you want, you can't quit. And that's the way I was raised. You know, we're men. We, we, we push back when we're pushed. If the standards are raised, we try to meet those. Today, he said, hey, you preaching in three hours. I could have said, man, you didn't give me no notice. I didn't have no time to study. I, why you always do this to me? I could have stayed home and not showed up tonight. But no, I had to, I had to you know, push back. We can, we can do that to each other because we're men. So we just have to keep that in mind, that it, it doesn't have anything to do with you know, who's equal, who's different, none of that. It's just how do you care for a certain thing. Uh, two more points, so I'll take my seat. So he says that first of all, I need you to care for them because they're weaker. And then he says, because they are heirs together of the grace of life. Literally, joint heirs. Uh, in short, it's, it's almost like he says, because you both have been saved. It's, it's got, Jesus didn't come back and say, okay, I'm here to save all the men. And if you happen to have a wife, she can come too. If not, that's okay. That's not what he said. He said that you guys are joint heirs. You both received the gracious gift of eternal life. So uh, if, if God values you as equals, why can't you? Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was uh, Paul in Galatians who said that in Christ there is no more male or female. Right. So she's been given the same privileges uh, that you have been given. So if that's good enough for God, why isn't it good enough for you? And the really last point is that uh, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And I have to be honest, when I, when I really got this, it, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. Because we love to guilt trip people who are not saved. I quote Isaiah and quote John saying, you know God won't hear sinners' prayers. And yes, he can hear, but he won't because he just won't. You're out of love unless you get baptized. You know, we love to do that. We do it all the time. I've been hearing that forever. And then it actually hit me that if I'm not giving my wife the proper amount of honor, God may actually close his ears to my prayers. Um, and that's, that's serious. That's something we don't think about. And I want to challenge the men that, you know, if you feel like if you're not getting ahead, if you're taking one step forward and two steps back, maybe God has actually chose, chosen not to listen to your prayers. This word hindered is a military term, and it speaks to, to sharply cutting off one's destination. Yeah. It's like if you've ever seen a high-speed chase, uh, the police will cooperate with the uh, with with police who are already ahead of where the car is going, and then they'll set up a roadblock. They may block the road with cars. They may put out tire spikes. So by the time you get there, you won't be able to keep going anymore. It's as if God does the same thing with us. Between us and and His ears, anthropomorphically, um, he, He's put He's put a roadblock there. So I, I, w- I want us all to, I just want to challenge the men tonight to uh, just to, just to think of that. Am I, am I doing this? Is God hearing me? So uh, just in review, we've seen what we are to do, how we are to do it, and we've seen three reasons why. And, and I want the women to know that this is a valuable lesson too because whether you are married or are looking to get married, uh, you need to know what standards you know, we, we look at all the wrong places for what a man should look like, what a husband should look like. We need to know the standards that he should meet. And we need to know that he knows the standards that he should meet. You know, I, I, I'm not proud to say that I've been married for four years. I didn't really know what this meant until two months ago, you know. You know, and, and, there, and there are plenty of other men who don't. So I just wanted to, um, to share some of my thoughts and really talk to the brothers tonight. Amen. So I can see that we're all family. We won't go through the the, the old uh, invitation to baptism and all that. But if you have any prayer requests or anything, now is your chance to come down front uh, as we see the Savior's invitation.
God has so smiled on me. Oh, He has set me free. I know my God has. Yes, He has smiled on me. I know that He so good to me. Singing a God has, oh yes, He has smiled on me. Yeah, he has set me free. I know my God has smiled on me. I know that He's been good. I know that he's been good. I know that he's been I know that he's been good. I know that he's been good. So good to me. first started preaching, I, I said to him, I said, I, I don't really care about uh, your style of delivery. I said, people will learn to love substance yes. over whatever the style is. I said, you do you. Mm -hmm. I said, I know it's not in your in your character to be hooping in, in care. No. <laughs> but, and, and every time he gets up in his own way, in his own style, he delivers a, a fantastic word. And you can tell he's well studied. And that he he really he really believes in what he's saying, and that makes it all the more better. When he said, "Well, I'm not proud to say that I've been married four years, and I and I just learned this two months ago," I thought, "I know folks been married forty years and still don't know it." <laughs> Thank God that you got it four years in, and, and and then you can you can you can make a course correction and go all the way to where you need to be, and versus realizing what you've got to almost the end of your journey, you realize you've been going the, the wrong way the whole time. It's a blessing. That's one thing I always say about being our age. It's a blessing to know what we know at this age so that the rest of our life we can pattern ourselves accordingly. We appreciate him so very much. It was a powerful yes. word. When he said he just had so many questions. Every week when I sit down to, to study and, and even prepare lessons, I start with a sheet of questions. And you quickly realize how challenging it is to answer all those questions. But it's powerful and it blesses you. So we appreciate them so very much. There were a couple of folks who were standing. I think, uh, so here you, okay, what do you have? Uh, I just want to uh, ask for prayer, continue prayers for my mom and for Clint and okay. Mark. Okay. So the final, did you have one? Yeah, I just